I have already mentioned at several locations that join ordering is also part of query optimization. And the task here is to find the cheapest or a cheap join ordering for a given query. So let's have a look at the more concrete problem statement here. When we say join query, we mean that we have multiple relations that are getting connected by join predicates. In this case, we consider simple equality predicates that would test if two attribute values of the named attribute or the columns are identical. And if so, and in this case we have multiple of these predicates, and if all of them are true, because we have a conjunction, then the um, concatenation of these tuples is the join result, or one tuple in the join result. So why can we talk about join ordering at all? Well, as we have already seen or discussed some um, time ago, the join operator is commutative and associative. That means we can write R join S or S join R, or we can write first the join between R and S and then with T, or first with S and T and then with R, right? And if we're talking about this join ordering problem, we will see later on we often make use of a, of a tree notation. And then in this case, on the right, uh, on this side here, we see there in the end, we can have a tree having a join between T. And here we have a join between R and S. Or in the case of the right hand side, um, it looks differently, right? And then we will be able to compute cost for the individual um, join trees and have to decide which one do we actually execute. When we have a query given with n relations, r1 to rn, and these equality predicates, we can look at this um, in form of a graph. This is called query graph. This is not to confuse with a join tree or query tree, because here we don't give any like, um, rule how we're computing the join. This join graph just depicts what do we want to join and which predicates do we have. So in this join graph, we have vertices, which are the relations. In this example here, we have students relation, attend relation, lectures and professors relation. And the edges between these vertices are given based on the predicates, right? For instance, here we are connecting the student relation with the attend relation, and the join predicate is done based on the student ID. Yeah? And similarly here for lecture ID and the employment ID to map the professors with the lectures. If we have two relations which are not connected by an edge, that means there's no join predicate. We could still, in principle, connect these two relations using a cross product, but this in general um, is expensive. So what we will do in the end later, we will differentiate between the cases where we allow cross products and where we don't allow cross products. So to make that more explicit or to say that again, um, cross products are often, or in general, considered expensive, but we will see also that in some cases cross products are a good way to go. So it would make sense in some cases to, to join or to connect two relations, even though there is no edge here. And this can lead to a cheaper join plan than without allowing these cross products. The good thing about cross products is if you're allowing them, your search space for the optimal solution gets larger. And since cross products can contribute to the cheapest plan, if you're allowing cross products, the overall solution has the potential to be better. Does not mean that you that like the best plan always has a cross product, probably it will not be the case in most cases. But if you're allowing cross products, you have more variety, more search space and um, this has more potential, right? But on, on the other hand, if you're allowing cross-products because the search space is getting larger, it's also more costly to find the best plan in your search space. So it's a trade-off. 
So let's assume we are not allowing cross products and then these predicates that we have seen on the previous slide that are constituting the edges of the query graph, they uh, make these query graphs look in specific shapes. For instance, in the previous slide where we had student and attending and so on and lectures and professors, also it was displayed not looking like a really like a chain, but it was a chain, right? So we went from from the student relation over attending and the lectures to the professors. So it was a chain query, we say, because the shape of this query graph, graph is a chain, looks like a chain. Query graphs can also be in the form of cycles. Yeah, or in form of stars. So this is a star, and this is of course a typical depiction of a star. Yeah. It can also be in the form of clicks, and here there's no difference between having cross products or not, because here all nodes are joinable with each other. We can have trees, or we can also have um, a cyclic um, graphs or grids. We will not look at all of these shapes, but we will see later on, um, depending on the on the query graph shape, for instance, Jane, you can come up with specific algorithms and also like to see how many possible query um, graphs or no, um, join plans you can actually have for certain query graphs. So in contrast to the query graph, which just would say what is joinable, the join tree is actually giving you like a rule how you're computing the actual query or the join query. So a join tree is a binary tree because the join operator is a binary operator. That means it has two inputs, left and right input. In this example, we have a join tree over four relations, are one, two, three, and four. And this is one example of a join tree that is possible for these four relations. So here we actually, what is also written below, here we actually specify what do we want to compute or how do we want to compute it. We say first we join R1 and R2, then we take the result of this and join it with R3. And then finally we take the result of this and join it with R4. So it's really like a rule. Um, what is the order, right? So it's like a join order realization. This one way to compute the query, right? And depending on the query graph shape, it is perhaps also possible to join R1 with R3 first, and then with R4, and then with R2, or we could also go and swap these two relations, right? And we could also swap the inputs of this operator, right? Here we see what is called a left deep join tree. Right. Left deep means that in this case, well, it looks like this, right? But we can also formulate it differently. What does left deep tree mean? Is that the right hand input of the join is always the relation. Yeah. Here and here, that the right input is always the relation, and the left input can be a join tree or a relation. So here for the lower, for the lowest join. Obviously, they are both inputs are relations, but for this join operator, you see that the left input is a join tree itself. But the right input here is always a relation. Similarly, we can define also right deep trees. So left deep trees, you see here, right deep is just defined the other way around. So the left input is always a relation, and then, then it looks like, um, yeah, right deep, not left deep. The zigzag tree uh, means that at least one input is a relation. Of course, we have to start here with two inputs are relations, but then for the other um, here, for this one and that one, at least one input is a relation, which also, of course, um, holds for this one because there are two is also at least one, uh, and um, important, not to confuse that because this illustration looks like this, it does not mean it's alternating. It does not mean it goes here and then there and then here and then there, right? So it, on, it only says like at least one input is a relation. 
it is easy to see that zigzag trees are subsuming the class of left deep trees and right deep trees. These three classes, so left deep, right deep and zigzag, are also called linear trees. Then we have also bushy trees, where there's no restriction on how the input of the operator should look like. So it can be, of course, only relations. We have to get a start, of course. And we see here that this operator has two inputs, which are both joint trees themselves. Right? The bushy tree subsumes all the other trees. So if we say we want we're allowing bushy trees in our optimization, that means that the result could also be a left deep tree, yeah? or a right deep tree, or a zigzag tree. Sometimes we say we want to allow only linear trees. And if we say bushy trees, we mean also all the other trees, right? Bushy trees is the most generic form of these trees. In some exercises or in the exams, in some cases, we, we say, um, is it possible to have a bushy tree? But then we say, um, which is not a linear tree, if you mean exactly something like this, right? Which is not linear here. So, but keep, keep in mind that the bushy tree is the most generic form and zigzag is more generic than left and right deep. So a left deep tree is also zigzag and right deep as well.